welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to ask um, Reverend Dr. Hugh Osgood some questions. So I'm going to start with an introductory question. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, wow. Which little bit do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Whichever bit you want. <laughs> um, I actually think that one of the big privileges I've had was serving as the Free Church's moderator and one of the Free Church's presidents. And when, when I was asked to do that, I was sort of brought in um, after my predecessor had resigned. And it was a, a, a sort of interesting moment. I, I could see this coming in my direction. I suppose partly because I'd got such a mixed free church background myself. Uh, grandparents were Salvation Army officers. I married a Baptist. I did much of my early preaching experience with the Methodists. Got really interested in the Quakers and we visited lots of Quaker sites and different things like that. So I did feel I was sort of sufficiently <laughs> aware of what was happening across the free churches group. I did spend some time as well as an Anglican and I, I did apply for the Anglican ministry. But they said I was too young and too inexperienced at the time, so, which was absolutely right. <laughs> so there's a little bit about me. No, lovely. Um, so why are you so um, excited about diversity in the broadest sense in the church? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because here we are talking about churches together. And I've come across two very different views on this. One is that we're together in order to try and form some kind of organisational unity or we're together to sort of learn how to respect and, 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 and benefit from each other. And being someone who's very much committed to that second concept, I just love the diversity. I just think it's so exciting. And when Jesus talks about, you know, people will know that you're my disciples and that you love one another, the fact that we're loving across that kind of diversity, I think, speaks more than if it was just a monolith of everyone remarkably similar. And when you look at creation, that's incredibly diverse. So when Jesus says, I will build my church, why shouldn't there be diversity in the church as well? And, and when I look at church history across the last, you know, two millennia, it seems that every time the church is getting a little bit stuck, God comes up with something that brings in a, a fresh perspective. And in fact, if you look at the variety of denominations within the Free Churches group, I could pretty much tell you what was that sort of initial calling that each of the churches had in order to bring fresh life to the whole. And I think that's the thing that really impresses me. It's about there's a, a sense of individual purpose and calling that you can see on each of these churches. And when I'm looking at Ephesians 4, which is part of my inspiration for the book, really, uh, it talks about as each part does its work. Mm. And I think the more that we can discover how each part can do its work and, and, and not just learn about each other, but learn from each other and engage with each other, mm. I think the more exciting it is. So, so I think diversity is wonderful. I think it's a fantastic opportunity. I think it, it does everything that it could do to enhance unity. So I'm excited about it. No, yeah, no, really good. OK, well, let's dig a little deeper. Is agreeing to disagree dangerous? <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be dangerous. Um, I do have a problem with, with that, in that very often what it sounds like is we can't be bothered to look at this topic anymore, so let's just say we agree to disagree. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we've got too many issues like that left on the horizon, it doesn't really work. Because what you end up with is that Although we're trying to disagree agreeably, you'll have a lot of people who feel that their views haven't fully been heard. And so for me, I'd like to say, let's admit that we don't agree, but let's press on to see if we can still work at this. Stay at the table, keep talking, and above all, keep listening. I think one of the reasons why I looked at the churches in Revelation is that to each one, the same message comes across, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And it's about a listening exercise. And I think, you know, I want to commend some of our denominations for the listening exercises that they've gone through, mm -hmm. which I think is amazing. But I would still like it to continue, because I think there are still voices that need to be heard that could be adding to the debate. No, thank you. 
Okay, well, a current topic. Would more kindness in the current sexual identity, same-sex marriage, equal marriage debate help? <clears throat> I'm not against kindness. I know I call the book, Is Kindness Killing the Church? But I was thinking of a particular kind of kindness where it just sort of becomes polite and we keep our distance from each other. I think actually being gracious and being kind in the way that we communicate is really important. I mentioned Ephesians 4. I mean, way, the way that Paul talks in the early part of that chapter is about being gracious and, and understanding and loving towards one another. So I think all of those things are really important. But we can't then just say, well, we'll be really kind to one another and I'll sort of bottle up all my opinions just because I want to be kind to you. Mm -hmm. I think there's more that needs to come out. Mm -hmm. and, and that's my concern mm -hmm. about it, really. I, I do think kindness is important. I'm not in favour of sort of argumentative vilification, but you know the kind of debate that we could have mm. if we continue to pursue things and, and to go beyond where we're at you see I feel that with the human sexuality debate and all of these kind of things the positions that people are taking are dependent upon some issues that we're not really looking at mm. see <clears throat> I think for example the nature of God mm. now some people have a, a view of God that God just wants to embrace everybody, mm -hmm. and other people have a different view. Mm -hmm. The nature of the church, that's also another big issue that doesn't get discussed. We, we just think we've all agreed to disagree on those things, mm -hmm. and yet they're big. The authority of scripture, mm -hmm. um, the nature of the relationship between church and society, and all of these things are issues that, that still need to be looked at and talked about. Some people are prepared to sort of stand on their soapbox and, and talk about them. But you need to hear where one another is at and then continue the conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm missing that some mm -hmm. of the time. I think there are incredible opportunities at the moment for people to actually present reasonable statements that then can be discussed and nuanced on some of these things like the nature of God and the nature of the church and the authority of scripture and and we're just reluctant some of us are talked to the world outside about these things and don't actually have the conversations in the church um, and I think that's where we could be doing more yeah no thank you what's the difference uh, what difference do you see between the unity of the <laughs> spirit and unity of faith um, well, these are two expressions that occur in Ephesians 4. Um, Paul talks about maintaining the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So he's obviously talking about a unity that we have and that we can celebrate and that we need to maintain. And that's great. And I do think that we could probably do a lot if we did a little bit of rethinking about unity being a gift rather than a goal because then it gives us a basis of, of how we're relating to one another. I am one with you and therefore I want to learn more about you and I want to learn from you because we've already got that oneness. When it comes to the unity of the faith it's talking about something that we have to go on to and it's talking about the fact that we need apostles and prophets, evangelists and teachers and pastors that are going to take us on and take us away from our immaturity where it says we're tossed around by every wind and, you know, and all of that kind of thing until we come to the maturity that's in Christ, that unity of the faith. Now, I have a vision of the unity of the faith which is like one day we'll know everything because we'll know the Lord and we'll see it all. And, and probably that level of unity is something that we might have to wait <laughs> for eternity to see. Mm -hmm. But that shouldn't stop us working mm -hmm. towards it. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I want to see is, is a kind of hunger for, for getting into the truth of issues, wanting to look at it a little bit more thoroughly and realizing that, yeah, we have got a unity of the spirit that we maintain and, and we've got that as a basic relationship. I recognize people as my brother and sister, but then we've got differences that we can work on 
and actually benefit from each other's opinion on. And I think that's really important. Yeah, no, thank you. How valuable are first century and 21st century parallels? <laughs> I'm one of these people who I think in the early days of Methodism, I would have been described as a primitive. <laughs> And I think also when you look at the roots of the Brethren movement, they had this same kind of thing. Let's get back to what it was like at the beginning. And I actually think that the way the church began gives us a good example of how the church is meant to be. So although there were problems in the first century church, there was a lot in the first century church to celebrate. Uh, the growth dynamic, the, the dynamism that was there in the church, um, you know, just the, just the, well, the energy that was there and being expressed, there wasn't a sort of big clergy laity divide. There were lots of things that I think were really exciting about the first century church. And I think that what we've done over the centuries is to some extent to lose that pattern mm -hmm. and to, to, to be able to look at it afresh and think there are things that we can learn from that first century church. Mm -hmm that would be amazing for us to get hold of. Of course, the other picture is to go right to the other extreme. You go to the last two chapters of Revelation and you see the picture of the church as it's ultimately going to be. So we're sitting here in the 21st century, somewhere between the original and the ultimate. <laughs> and we can learn from both. We're aspiring to the ultimate, but we're building on the original. And one of the things I love about the first century church was the unity that it had was a very robust unity. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the, the differences, and they were big differences, that, you know, they were as big as the kind of differences we're experiencing today. And, and the differences over um, how much you embrace the Jewish law as a Gentile believer, that was huge. And, and that was, was, you know, it could have ended up with um, the church being fractured. And I could imagine the church in Antioch being a bit fed up with the church in Jerusalem and saying, you know, we, we, we just distance ourselves from that. We do our thing, you do yours. But I can see that the church in Antioch had a commitment to unity as well as truth. And I think because they had that commitment to unity, they were prepared to go to Jerusalem and thrash it out with the leaders at Jerusalem. And, and press on until they could say at the end of the discussion, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I really admire that. I think that robust unity could be a great encouragement for us today. Mm -hmm. It's not the kind of kindness where we politely say, you do your thing and I do mine. It's a bit more than that. Yeah. So I think we can learn from that. And uh, I really hope that, that we can pick up some of those kind of things. Yeah. A final question from me before perhaps we open it to, to other questions. How should local churches interrelate? So a bit of a, a comment on local ecumenism. <sighs> well, I suppose I, I came into the national picture via the local picture mm. um, and have been very involved at a local level. And the funny thing is when I was um, trying to find it, the, the diversity expressions of church that you get at a local level, um, I think just about everyone I've talked to in various countries have said, do you know, we've just got that as well. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not a denominational mix. In fact, some of the millennials these days don't talk about denominationalism. They talk about style tribes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what style of church do you go to? Mm -hmm. What style tribe do you belong to? Mm -hmm. And they might be just as happy in a, an Anglican church of a particular style as they would be in a Pentecostal one. Mm -hmm as long as it does the same kind of things. Mm. So, you know, when I came up with these sort of seven different churches, I, I could see them in the locality I live, but I could see them in just about every other locality mm. that I visited. And, and they are very, very diverse. Mm. And, you know, if we can get it right at a local level where, where churches are prepared to, to work at stuff with each other, mm. um, I know it doesn't have to be at a ministerial level, some of it, some of the theological discussion. Mm. But there's an awful lot that can happen just by people feeling mobilized and motivated. Mm -hmm. So I deliberately wanted to write the book um, for people that are church members, not just church leaders, um, so that they also can get excited about unity and pressing on to truth. 
And there's a lot that we do do together in terms of social action. But, you know, I'd love some of our local pastors to actually say, why don't you and I sit down and discuss some of these things mm. where we've got totally different perspectives on it yeah. and see if we can learn from each other. I think that would be good. Yeah, no, brilliant. Well, thank you. That, that's all the questions from me. I want to open um, perhaps our questions from the floor. If we can stick to questions rather than comments, that will, will help us in particular because um, we are, are wanting uh, to, to broadcast this video um, further afield. So any questions from anyone um, in the room? Thank you. Jonathan. Yeah, can I ask you about the, the structure of the book and, and without giving all the content away, a little flavour of it, and also whether you think it's something that could be used in a small group discussion environment? Yeah, I, it definitely could be used in a small group discussion. My one hesitation when I was writing the book about small group discussion was I didn't want there to be a sort of disgruntled group that were working on my book <laughs> despite what the church leader really felt about it. I thought that would be a bit of a disaster. So I have written it to make sure that, that people can read it as an individual. But I do think there is plenty of opportunity to discuss. And we put questions um, at the end of each section so that they can be either considered personally or, or discussed. And what I do want, though, is for people to not just focus in on, I think I found my church, <laughs> because this is about hearing what the Spirit is saying to the churches and learning across the breadth, which was so much part of what was going on with the Revelation churches. And um, talking about the structure of the book, I was struggling at one point to find a voice um, I could see that it would be good to write some kind of pastoral letter to the churches once I'd describe their different characteristics, encouraging them to maintain those characteristics and contribute to the whole. But I thought, I don't want this to sound like me being very presumptuous and saying, this is what the Lord is saying to the churches, or this is what the Spirit is saying to the churches, or even worse to say, this is what I'm saying to the churches. And so what I did was to look at it in terms of, just imagine those seven churches in Revelation had actually applied the prescription that Jesus gave each one of them. And instead of having their lampstand removed, they actually were burning brightly. And what would the voices of those seven leaders, if you put them together, bring to us? What could they say to us? What could they say in the light of their own experience where they'd had correction and benefited from the correction. So the way I put the book together is this. There's a first century church narrative that runs through. So we cover the sort of uh, uh, pre-Pentecost, we cover Pentecost, we then go on and talk about how the church grew right through and we're looking at the Corinthian church in the end. But at the end of those passages, there's a discussion point. Then you come to where we're going to write a letter to one of the churches. And I deliberately chose sort of stereotypical names. I didn't try and, you know, be too clever. Being a preacher, you know, you can always think of seven things that begin with C. So, <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and that's what I did. And, and, and as it were, imagined a letter coming from those, if you like, restored churches in Revelation to speak to churches today. So that's the structure of the book. So that's how it works. It's got, it's got quite a long bit at the beginning where I, I lay out some of the sort of more theological stuff really as simply as I can. And there's a bit at the end which really sort of goes back to look at the ultimate picture. So as I said, we're sort of pitching ourselves between the original and the ultimate. Mm. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Any other questions? Just to, if you ask a question, just say your name as well. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Sure. Um, where do you see the role of power in unity? Um, for instance, some churches, it might be a cost to be unkind compared to others. Yeah, where do you see the role of power in unity? That's a very good question, Shamira. Where do we see the role of power in unity? I once had this thought that 
the unity of the church is the greatest power the world has never seen. Mm. And I was thinking that in the light of what happened at the Tower of Babel, when there was a unity that needed to be disrupted because it was an arrogant unity that was seeking to sort of reach up to heaven and, and touch God rather than to allow God to reach down and touch them. But the church is the opposite of the Tower of Babel, you know, and we come together in a unity. And I, I think there is a power in unity. But I do think that we've already, in a sense, got that power. And a lot of it is, is dissipated because we are not celebrating the unity that we've got. I really would like us to celebrate that unity. And one of the reasons I'm writing the book is I do want churches to have confidence in their own distinct calling, because I think we need to stop apologizing for our diversity. I think it's crazy when we're coming out with expressions like, well, the reason the world doesn't respect us is because we've got so many different expressions. I'm absolutely certain if the church was a sort of monolith that spoke mm. in a monotone, the world wouldn't listen any more mm. than it does now. Mm. And in effect, I think it would probably listen less because they'd say, oh, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Mm. But the fact that we've got this diversity and we, we can work that diversity effectively, I think that's, that's really, really powerful. And I think we can celebrate that and demonstrate that. And I think there's a huge power in that. But it's, it's not the power of a church that's here to sort of do what's happened in previous centuries, which is to take over the government of the world kind of mindset. It's the church in which it demonstrates the power of Jesus, which was in brokenness. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe I'm a little bit different from everyone else, but I know that very often we're, we're desperate to see the church come together as one. But I like the picture of the feeding of the 5,000, that in order to feed 5,000, there had to be brokenness. And um, I'm quite comfortable with that. I'm quite comfortable with our differences. And I think that can be a power, power in the diversity. Great question, Shmera, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I just wondered if that was what the kind of power you were referring to, Shmara, because I've heard your question in a slightly different light. Go ahead, Rowena, yeah. Um, about the power of the current structures. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? And the unwillingness of folk to, all of us, to, to, to give up such, such power as we've given up. Yeah, I think that, that is another side of it, isn't it? Um, that's the very opposite of, of the power of brokenness. That's the power of arrogance, you know, where my view has to hold. And, and that's the kind of, of approach that I feel, I, I, to me, one of the biggest correctives that comes across in Revelations chapters two and three is hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And I, I actually see that as a corrective. It's not just the, um, the particular statements that was given to each individual church in, with different words. But it's actually every time, it's like, you've got to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, rather than just, I know what I believe and this is it. So I think there's a, a power in the brokenness, which involves the surrendering of that power of arrogance where we're trying to hold on to our position and and, and stand on a soapbox rather than be humble enough to listen to everyone else. Because, you know, you can have strong views and when you listen to other people, you discover that what they think you're saying is not what you're saying at all. And if you don't listen, you'll just carry on saying what you're thinking and confusing everybody. So, so I think that this whole process of engaging and listening is something that's very much on my heart. Any any other any other last questions? Can I have a second one? <laughs> <laughs> Jump in. Um, there are two phrases that I, I've come across in recent years, one well, very recently, um, about unity, which kind of strike a chord with me. One, and I'm interested in your comments on, on the one is 
um, reconcile diversity, which sounds like the kind of thing that you you keep on. Um, and the second, much more recent, in the World Council of Churches Unity Statement last year that came from the General Assembly, they used the phrase an ecumenism of the heart, which is all about Christ-like love before anything else. So those two statements, how do you, how do you understand them and, and, and would you agree with them? Well, reconcile diversity straight away. I think that's, that's great. I think the diversity is really important. We're reconciled through the work that Christ did on the cross. The dividing walls are broken down. We need to realize that and, and benefit from that. And I see that in the first century church very, very clearly. Um, the other expression, which was an ecumenism of the heart, um, part of the, the challenge for some of us is that ecumenism gained a sort of baggage early on that we're having to work our way through. Um, and that has been a real challenge indeed for people that have come from an evangelical background, looking at joining churches together in England and hearing the word ecumenism and thinking, is this a pressure group to get us to leave our current positions and become part of some kind of bland whole in a single organizational structure. And, and so I must admit, I carry a little bit of that um, concern from a communication point of view. So I did use the word interchurch quite a lot in the book, mm. just simply to sort of make sure that people weren't mishearing what I wanted to say. But certainly of the heart, I think is really important but I do feel, going back to the first century, that you can see that the unity that the church had really came about because of the move of the Spirit at Pentecost. Mm. And there needs to be some kind of radical transformation that brings about a heart unity. Um, it can't just be human sentimentality. Mm. It's got to be more than that. It's got to be the heart that's been changed by the Lord, that knows the love of God shed abroad in that heart, and then you get a bonding together. Um, and I think it's that, and I'd want to make sure that we're not talking about uh, a, a uniformity that's held together by sentimentality, which could be the way some people would pick up the ecumenism of the heart. But if we're talking about uh, a real bonding together across churches, that comes about because people are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and have had a heart transformation in that sense. I can see that being a really strong bonding. Mm. Hugh, past president <laughs> of the Free Churches Group in Churches <laughs> Together in England, thank you for talking to us tonight.